You're watching Northern Crimes. Alaska. It's one of the most expansive, rugged, and dramatic landscapes on the planet. For travelers and seekers near and far, Alaska is a land of opportunity. For the indigenous people and the folks who call it home, it's a lifeline for culture, family, and sustenance. But for anyone who travels its winding roads, its twisting trails, or its alluring wilderness, all too often, Alaska becomes the land of the lost. Today's video covers the story of five people who mysteriously vanished in Alaska. Their stories are different. They all came from different places, different walks of life, with different hopes and different dreams. But these five people had one thing in common. They all disappeared in South Central Alaska. That is the land spanning a radius of about 150 miles from Anchorage, the largest city in the state. By Alaskan terms, Anchorage is, quote, the big city and has the densest population with about 350,000 people. Most travelers going to and from Alaska will start their journey in Anchorage, as it's the gateway to the beautiful Kenai Peninsula, the bountiful Matanuska Valley, and the majestic Denali National Park. But Anchorage and the land surrounding it can also be deceiving. The metropolitan area, just like any big city in the U.S., is bristling with an underbelly of crime, with the highest rates of domestic violence in all of North America. And for those seeking a backcountry getaway, although the mountains, lakes, and trails around Anchorage might seem inviting, they can also be deceptively dangerous. As you'll soon find out. On the evening of Monday, March 29, 2004, an Anchorage police officer was making his rounds through Anchorage's city parks. That evening, he pulled into DeLong Lake, a wooded, semi-secluded lake off Jewel Lake Road. While there, the officer noticed a black 1995 Ford pickup truck. After a quick search of the area and not finding anything suspicious, the officer left the scene. The next morning, another police officer entered the parking area of DeLong Lake and noticed the Ford pickup truck hadn't been moved. After a more thorough search of the area, the officer noticed a dog in the bed of the truck, which was covered with a canopy. The officer called in the plates to dispatch and was informed the vehicle belonged to 31-year-old Damon Bonds. Investigators reached out to Damon's girlfriend, who said she'd last seen him on Monday, reporting that, quote, he did not seem suicidal. Later that day, a team of searchers combed the woods surrounding the Long Lake, turning up no leads. According to the Anchorage Daily News, after a fruitless search Tuesday, the police department's auxiliary search team and other volunteers spent several hours Wednesday looking for bonds in the woods and neighborhoods surrounding DeLong Lake, covering roughly a two-mile radius. A dog trained to find cadavers assisted, but no signs of bonds were found. According to interviews with friends, Damon Bonds had moved to Anchorage from Texas about five years prior. Although he'd reportedly been going through a custody battle and struggling financially, both Bonds' girlfriend and friends reported he'd been in good spirits prior to his disappearance. They were also adamant that if Bonds was going to harm himself, he never would have left his beloved dog, Scully, to freeze alone in the vehicle. Later that week, Bond's father, David, flew from Houston, Texas to Anchorage, where he put up a $20,000 reward for, quote, information leading to the safe return of Damon Bonds or information leading to the arrest and conviction of those responsible for his disappearance. According to an interview with the Anchorage Daily News, Bonds' father was quoted as saying, there was too many things that don't make sense about his son's disappearance. Damon left his truck unlocked, his cell phone inside, and his dog trapped in the bed of the truck, all of which are out of character. 
Additionally, Anchorage police labeled Bond's disappearance as, quote, a missing person with suspicious circumstances. So this begs the question, what happened to Damon Bonds? I actually live in Anchorage, so I'm very familiar with DeLong Lake. The lake, although surrounded by dense woods, is also surrounded by dozens of houses. It's actually a fairly heavily populated area. When Bonds went missing, the lake would have been frozen, and the woods would have been covered with a blanket of snow. Clearly, no tracks were found when searchers were in the area. It's possible that Bonds, if walking across the lake, could have fallen through the ice. But I went back and checked the weather for March 27, 2004. The temperatures hovered in the low 20s, and there was no fresh snow. So it seems if he would have fallen through the ice, searchers would have found a hole. Additionally, the lake is a popular destination for families boating, swimming, and fishing in the summer. The lake isn't especially deep, so if Bonds was in the water, it seems highly likely that his remains would have been discovered. Another theory is that Bonds could have met with foul play. I can't find any evidence that Bonds was into drugs, but DeLong Lake is certainly a place where drug deals happen. Whether drugs were involved or not, it seems possible that Bonds could have met up with someone or some people in the parking lot, been abducted, and taken elsewhere. Over the years, Damon Bond's father and other family members have made dozens of pilgrimages to Alaska to continue looking for their son. Bond's father has been quoted as saying he's convinced that whatever happened to his son did not happen at DeLong Lake. The family has also hired private investigators and narrowed down who they believe to be suspects, passing that information on to authorities, all to no avail. In 2005, Bonds' mother sought the help of a psychic, who told her that, quote, her son had been murdered, shot on the right side of the head, and that his body had been dumped off a cliff. The first thing that comes to mind are the bluffs on the west side of Anchorage, hovering above the silty waters of Cook Inlet. It's possible that Bonds could have been dumped off one of these cliffs, but it also seems likely some trace of him would have been found, unless, of course, his remains were carried out into the ocean. The unfortunate reality is that the trail, like the late March temperatures when Damon disappeared, simply went cold. To this day, no trace of Damon Bonds has been found. As recent as 2016, his family was still looking for him, creating a GoFundMe page. In 2012, the Facebook page Seeking Alaska's Missing published a letter from Damon's father on what would have been Damon's 40th birthday. My name is David Bonds. Some of you know me, some of you don't. My son's been missing from Anchorage, Alaska since March 2004. We have no clue what happened to him. He's just gone. So, as far as I'm concerned, he's still out there, somewhere. Next week is his 40th birthday. The two attachments are ads that will be running in the Anchorage Daily News, newspaper and online, all week, 5-7 to 5-13. Because I believe he's still out there, I'd like these ads to reach as many people as possible in hopes that he might somewhere, somehow, see them. The favor I'm asking is please forward this to everyone in your address book. The more people we reach, the more likely he is to see it. Just a father trying to hold on to some semblance of sanity and his son. On Wednesday, June 3, 1998, a 36-year-old Japanese student named Hiroko Nomoto boarded a Northwest Airline jet and embarked on a one-way flight to Anchorage, Alaska. According to the Charlie Project, Nomoto was a senior majoring in psychology at Michigan State University in East Lansing, Michigan in 1998. As reported by Nomoto's friends, she'd been feeling depressed as she had received a B grade in one of her classes. Apparently, she was accustomed to getting straight A's, and this high level of pressure she put on herself could have been a cultural anxiety 
stemming from her upbringing in Japan. Although she was only 10 credits shy of her undergraduate degree, Nomoto reportedly told friends she would not be returning to school. Additionally, she was said to have sold the majority of her clothing and given a multitude of Japanese mementos to friends before she left. Interestingly enough, when Nomoto's friends dropped her off at the airport on June 3rd, they believed she was flying back to Japan. She also was known to keep in weekly contact with her family, particularly her mother in Japan. Only later would her friends and family learn that she had flown to Anchorage, Alaska. According to a story in the Anchorage Daily News printed on March 22, 1999, Nomoto arrived in Alaska on June 4, 1998. Nomoto spent her first night in Alaska at the Denali Winsong Lodge. The next day, she traveled to Anchorage and spent the night at a hostel at 700 H Street. Nomoto had made reservations for the ferry from Whittier to Valdez and had a reservation at the Westmark Hotel in Valdez on June 6th. She never showed up, either at the ferry or the hotel. Local police tracked her to the Windbreak Hotel in Wasilla on June 8, 1998. She then had breakfast with a man she met June 9. He drove her to the bus station to catch a bus at Denali Park. That was the last time Nomoto was seen. She was not seen at Denali Park. Police believe her disappearance may have resulted from foul play. Now, this is where the story gets a little fuzzy. The reality is there is very little information about Nomoto's case. Other than the Anchorage Daily News story from March 22, 1999, there is only one other story I could find, which was published shortly after her disappearance. Let's look at some of the details. First, it's interesting that Nomoto spent her first night in Alaska at the Denali Winsong Lodge. The lodge, which is now called Earthsong Lodge, is on the outskirts of Denali National Park in a small town called Healy, which is almost a four-hour drive from Anchorage. It's unclear how Nomoto would have gotten there, but a reasonable guess would be a bus or shuttle service. The next day, she reportedly traveled back to Anchorage, another four-hour drive, and stayed at the youth hostel on 8th Street, which is located in downtown Anchorage. Apparently, it was at this time that she booked a train to the small fishing town of Whittier, along with a ferry and hotel in Valdez, scheduled for Saturday, June 6. According to an Anchorage Daily News article from August 8, 1998, she purchased a train ticket to Whittier and a ferry ticket from Whittier to Valdez for June 6. Both tickets were used, but Nomoto never checked into the Valdez Hotel, where she had reservations. Although no one seems to have seen her in Whittier or on the ferry, it appears that she did go on the trip, as evidenced by police and the Anchorage Daily News reporting her tickets, quote, were used. It's unclear where Nomoto stayed June 6th or June 7th. That said, she reportedly headed north again, staying at the Windbreak Hotel in Wasilla, about 45 miles north of Anchorage on June 8th. It was there the following morning, June 9, that she reportedly, quote, had breakfast with a man she met June 9. He drove her to the bus station to catch a bus to Denali Park. That was the last time Nomoto was seen. She was not seen at Denali Park. Let's look at some theories as to what might have occurred. First, at least to me, the most obvious theory is suicide. This is evidenced by multiple factors, including Nomoto selling and giving away her belongings before the trip, purchasing a one-way ticket to Anchorage without telling anyone, and her reported depression around receiving a B grade in one of her classes. In my view, her travels in Alaska also seemed a bit erratic, as evidenced by her arriving in Anchorage, heading north toward Denali National Park, then back to Anchorage, south to Whittier and Valdez, then back to Wasilla, and reportedly back north to Denali National Park. That being said, why hasn't her body or remains been found? The next obvious theory is foul play. The thing I'm curious about is the man Nomoto reportedly met on the morning of Tuesday, June 9th, who stated they had eaten breakfast together before he dropped her off to catch a bus to Denali National Park. Unfortunately, there is no further information about who this man was. 
One can assume that the Alaska State Troopers interviewed him and determined he was not a person of interest. That isn't to say that Nomoto couldn't have met up with foul play elsewhere. Although Wasilla and the stretch of road heading north to Denali are thoroughly populated, it's a very remote region compared to a lot of places in the lower 48. And I can attest from my own experience, there's a plethora of dubious characters inhabiting that region. The final theory is that Nomoto chose to get lost. Most shuttles and buses that head to Denali National Park will stop at least six or seven times along the way. Most of these stops are at remote gas stations, trail entrances, or scenic pull-offs on the park's highway. The Anchorage Daily News story published on March 22, 1999, stated that after she was dropped off at the bus stop in Wasilla, that was the last time Nomoto was seen. She was not seen at Denali Park. So it stands to reason that she could have left the bus stop in Wasilla on her own accord or with someone else. Or she got on the bus, then got off at one of the stops, walking off into the unknown. Unfortunately, to this day, what happened to Hiroko Nomoto remains a mystery. In late July 2016, Bradford Broach, a 46-year-old accounting manager from Allen, Texas, was on vacation with his family in Alaska. When his wife and daughter returned home, Broach decided to stay in Alaska, reportedly to enjoy some extended time off. On Tuesday, August 2, 2016, Broach was staying at the Hotel Alieska, a monolithic structure at the foot of Alieska Resort in the forested ski town of Girdwood, 35 miles south of Anchorage. That evening, Broach apparently decided to go for an evening hike on the Winter Creek Trail, a gentle footpath through the rainforest not far from the hotel. Broach signed the Winter Creek Trail registry at 9.45 p.m., then briefly interacted with another hiker. After that, he headed down the obvious and well-maintained trail, presumably anticipating a short evening stroll. But when Broach failed to catch his flight home on August 4th, his family contacted the Alaska State Troopers, and his search was initiated. Over the next few weeks, troopers utilized the support of Alaska Mountain Rescue Group, Anchorage Nordic Ski Patrol, the Girdwood Volunteer Fire Department, as well as hotel employees and members of the community. Helicopters flew the valleys, search dogs scoured the forests, and a local kayaker even ran the rivers, searching for any sign of brooch, all to no avail. By the end of the month, all searches were called off, and to this day, no sign of brooch has ever been found. Another person lost in Alaska. Now, first of all, you might think it odd that Broach headed out for a hike at 9.45 p.m. Well, to Alaskans, this isn't really a big deal, as the light lingers on close to midnight during that time of year. I've actually hiked the Winter Creek Trail numerous times, and for even a hiker with little to no experience, it's hard to imagine getting lost on that trail. For example, the trail is well-traveled, about four to six feet wide in most places, after hiking about a mile, the trail comes to a T. If you head right, it heads slightly uphill, deep into a mountain valley, and peters out after a few miles. If you head left, which is the main route, the trail follows a meandering path for a mile or two to a hand trolley over a gorge, finally ending up at the well-traveled Crow Creek Road. As I stated before, there was an extensive rescue effort, one that lasted weeks, with multiple organizations including Alaska State Troopers and the Alaska Mountain Rescue Group. Here's an audio clip from a 2018 interview I did with Bill Romberg for the podcast Alaska Unsolved. Bill is an experienced member of the Alaska Mountain Rescue Group and one of the people who searched for Bradford Brooch. There was the gentleman who disappeared right out the back door of the Alaska Hotel walked out the Winter right. Creek Trail, right. and uh, for all intents and purposes, seemed to be enjoying his Alaska visit. He had family here for a while. He went for a hike late at night, 
you know, to, you know, get some pictures of the Winter Creek Gorge. Uh, at least that's what, you know, we, we understood. And he never came back. And we spent six straight days looking for him. And this is an area where there's dozens and dozens of people hiking all the time. Maybe not right at dusk, but you have the Winter Creek Gorge. You have that, you know, canyon that flows through there. Um, and then that flushes into, you know, Glacier Creek. But you have all that heavy the terrain around those trails um you also have large carnivores uh, and we had pretty good cell phone forensic information on like he's definitely in this triangle he's not over there by the tesoro station and we put a lot of resources into that area for for days and days and then we, and they, the searching continued after the kind of the large-scale effort ramped down i mean the fire the local fire department kept searching the river systems Local dog teams kept going out on those trails for training purposes to try and find him, and we still have not found him. And uh, and those are fr- those are really you know challenging. It, you know, we think that given the the resources we can bring to bear now compared to 20 years ago, and the technology oh, that's yeah. available to us, and whether it's cell phone forensics or um, you know, there's just a lot of ways that people can be tracked. Right. <laughs> the fact that we you know spent that much time and effort and were unable to. Uh, to find him is uh, is very frustrating, and, and uh, that's just one example. Right. And- Although Romberg's account paints a picture of the difficulties of locating any sign of brooch, it still leaves many unanswered questions. So let's take a look at a few theories. To me, the most obvious theory is that Bradford Brooch somehow got turned around and got lost. That said, I have a hard time imagining Brooch hiking past the T about a mile into the hike. It should have been simple. He should have just turned around and walked back. But maybe he did go beyond the T. If he headed left, he should have ended up at the trolley across the gorge. He could have crossed it and ended up at Crow Creek Road. But if he headed right, he could have somehow got off trail and got lost. Which brings me to another point. One thing that happens when people get lost is that they panic. Let's say Broach somehow got off trail and started to panic. He wouldn't have been thinking clearly, which could have led him to make poor decisions and get himself even more lost or perhaps injured. Another option is that he could have gotten hypothermia. I checked the weather conditions in Girdwood on those days and the temperatures ranged between the mid 50s in the upper 60s Fahrenheit. There was a small amount of rain, so if he did get wet, it is possible he could have gotten hypothermia. I think it's highly unlikely that Broach could have met with foul play. Winter Creek Trail wouldn't be the kind of place bad actors hang out unless he met someone at the parking lot, which could have been a possibility. The only other option is a gruesome one, and that is that Broach could have encountered a bear. This unfortunately is highly plausible, as Girdwood arguably has one of the highest concentrations of black bears in South Central Alaska. That said, it's interesting that no sign of brooch, no clothing, no bones, no phone or piece of equipment has ever been found. On Saturday, September 26, 2015, at around 9.30 a.m., a 2012 Toyota Tundra truck was found near a pond located off the Seward Highway at mile 87.5, just south of Girdwood. The vehicle, which belonged to Anchorage resident 38-year-old Kevin Mitchell, was located after friends and family had been searching for him for almost four days. According to the Alaska Dispatch News, Mitchell had last been seen Tuesday, September 22nd, when he stopped by his South Anchorage home at around 11.30 a.m. in his municipal light and power truck. The father of two, an engineer, left in his personal 2012 Toyota Tundra without taking his wallet or ID, his wife Nicole Mitchell said. Once the vehicle was found, an extensive search was conducted via a coordinated effort by the Alaska State Troopers, Alaska Mountain Rescue Group, and a plethora of volunteers, many of whom worked with or were close to Kevin Mitchell. In the following days, searches focused mostly on the mountain rising directly above the pond where Mitchell's truck was found, 
During the search, multiple items were found, including tarps and empty drink bottles in the thick brush and steep creek beds. That said, none of the items could be tied directly to Mitchell. According to the Alaska Dispatch News story published on September 28th, a helicopter from Alpine Air Alaska and Alieska Helicopters helped to deliver a radio repeater to a peak for better communication via donated radios used by the searchers on the mountainside. On Tuesday, September 29, after three days of exhaustive searches and with the weather continuing to deteriorate, Alaska State Troopers called off the search. Kevin Mitchell has been missing ever since. Kevin's disappearance is interesting, and it's also very sad. Apparently, he disappeared on the eve of his 11th wedding anniversary. Additionally, he was successful in his career, had a loving family, and was athletically strong and competent in the outdoors. But his wife, Nicole, told the Alaska Dispatch News, He hadn't been feeling well lately. He had been having some medical issues. He was having some anxiety about his health issues. I think maybe he is not in a clear state of mind. Although she didn't go into specifics about his reported health issues, she did mention that he was not taking medication at the time of his disappearance. So let's take a look at some theories. Personally, I think foul play can be excluded from Kevin's disappearance. He left town without his wallet or ID. If someone wanted to rob him, there was nothing to take, and his vehicle was left unlocked with the keys inside. That said, in a strange turn of events, another vehicle was found on Saturday, September 26, during the search about a quarter mile from where Kevin's truck was located. In that vehicle was the dead body of 41-year-old Anchorage resident Joseph Melton. Authorities concluded that he'd committed suicide as he was wanted by police for a crime I'm not going to mention in this video, though if you're curious, I'll leave a link in the description. What I think is more probable is in line with what Kevin's wife, Nicole, stated, that her husband was in emotional and or psychological distress and that he might have not been thinking clearly. The bigger question is where did he go? Based on the evidence, there's really only a few options. A, he parked his truck and walked directly into the woods or up a mountain heading east into the endless expanse of Chugach National Forest where he either took his own life or died from exposure. Or B, he crossed the Seward Highway and walked out into the mudflats, letting the glacial tides of Turnigan Arm wash over him and take him away. Mitchell's family, and I think rightly, believes the former is what occurred, as they've stated that in an online memorial to the man they still love and miss deeply. Our final story takes place about 65 miles south of Anchorage, deep in Chugach National Forest, at a serene campground called Granite Creek. On Saturday, July 7, 2012, 43-year-old Anchorage resident Valerie Sifsoff was camping at Granite Creek with her boyfriend, Elliot Freeberg. The two were enjoying the long weekend in one of the most beautiful and scenic campgrounds along the Seward Highway. Surely there were other campers about, as the campground is often reserved in advance during July weekends. It's a gorgeous place with dozens of tent sites dotted along its two-mile dirt road loop. One of the main draws of the campground is the mountain-fed Granite Creek, which lulls campers to sleep with its ambient rushing in the distance. But as the day turned into evening, the mood changed. Something happened. Valerie and Elliot had a fight, and apparently Sifsoff walked off into the night, never to be seen again. This is the last photo ever taken of Valerie Sifsoff. According to the first story printed by the Anchorage Daily News on July 11, 2012, a camping companion said Sifsoff got upset about something and walked away from camp about midnight. The other person looked for Sifsoff but left the campground about noon Sunday after she didn't return. 
The article goes on to say, The initial missing person report came in about 11.30 a.m. Wednesday after Sifsoff had not contacted friends or family. Now, what's striking about this story is that Sifsoff's camping companion, her boyfriend of 10 years, Elliot Freeberg, left the campground on Sunday without her. What's even more striking is that he didn't report her missing until Wednesday, over three days later, and only then a search was initiated. But more details emerged in another ADN story published on July 22nd. About 2 p.m., the couple of nearly a decade quarreled over the campfire. But despite the rain and arguing, they managed to have a good time. They listened to music on portable speakers. They drank Sam Adams light beers and Glen Levette scotch whiskey. Around midnight, the two argued again, and Valerie walked off from the campsite in the direction of the outhouses and other campsites. She'd been drinking, as had Freeberg, but she wasn't stumbling or slurring her words. The story continues. Freeberg says he thought Valerie was just leaving to cool off from the argument, which she had done before. She wore a black DKNY sweatshirt, blue sweatpants, and black rain boots, and silver-rimmed sunglasses. She left her Michael Kors purse and iPhone 4, items she was not known to easily part with, in the car. Around 2 a.m., when Valerie hadn't returned, he walked around the campground loop looking for her. Around 4 a.m., he fell asleep. He woke a few hours later and, with still no sign of her, drove back to Anchorage. He said he thought that possibly she had somehow gotten back to the city and was outside their apartment. She wasn't. Over the next several days, he made several trips back to the area to look for Valerie. He said he didn't know what to do. He reported her missing to troopers on Wednesday morning, more than three days after she'd walked away from the campsite. Freeberg said he doesn't really know why he didn't contact police earlier, but he wishes he had. Tears filled his eyes when he talked about how long Valerie had been missing. In interviews with Sifsoff's father, he acknowledges that it was strange that Freeberg didn't report her missing for three days. But he also stated that he trusted Freeberg's sincerity and included him in the searches. It appears that Alaska State Troopers also concluded that Freeberg was not a person of interest in Valerie Sifsoff's disappearance. Over the course of the summer and into the fall, the tight-knit Sifsoff family continued searching for Valerie, setting up a blog with updates and keeping the press involved. Then, in early October, a clue emerged. Volunteers get ready to head out with Sifsoff friends and family. Has anyone here not seen what she's wearing? The mission? To find 43-year-old Valerie Sifsoff, who authorities say went missing from this site three months ago. This is her silver frame aviator sunglasses, a DKNY ho hoodie. The plan? Break up in groups, some on foot. All right, move in! At times, walkers had to deal with vegetation so thick you could barely move forward. There was a lot of real bushwhacking, real, real woods out there, real alders. And, I mean, it was, it, there was at times when it was absolutely difficult. Others hit the water by raft. The river's pretty good. It's about the same level as before. Um, it changed quite a bit. It, obviously, there was more water before, and the uh, channels have changed, and there's more logs, log jams. And four-wheelers patrol the terrain. For some, the extensive search through daunting woods is just part of answering a call for help. I think that it's part of God's plan. He wants us to help each other, you know. It's easy. You can't. It's part of the Alaskan way, you know. But a certain somberness comes with the job. You know, it's kind of a grim business looking for somebody that you're not sure if they're alive or dead or, you know, you hope. After hours of sweeping the area, some news is received. We just got called by the Sifsoff family uh, that uh, they found some items that they want us to come take a look at. At long last, the possibility of a clue comes bittersweet for the Sifsoff family. At this point, I, I don't know for 100% sure what, what they found, um, but it does sound like it's tied to Valerie in some ways. So. Efforts were slated to go until 6.30 this evening. However, because of the items of interest that were found, the search has been called off for the rest of the night so troopers can further examine the evidence. Reporting from Granite Creek... 
The item found was Valerie's DKNY sweatshirt, which was located about a half mile downstream from the campground, close to where it intersects with the dangerous and turbulent Six Mile River. According to the Anchorage Daily News, at the end of August, a kayaker found a green shirt in the same area of Six Mile Creek, and it was later determined to belong to Sifsoff. She also was believed to be wearing it when she disappeared. Troopers have a photo of her from that camping trip wearing the sweatshirt with the green shirt seen underneath. In late November 2012, Valerie Sifsoff's family held a memorial service for their beloved daughter, sister, auntie, and friend. But even though, in a sense, they were saying goodbye to her, the search wouldn't end. Although the family continued searching over the winter and have kept hope and memories alive, to this day, no other sign of Valerie has been located. So what could have happened to her? Although it would be easy to place blame on Sifsoff's boyfriend, I'm going to refrain from doing that. Clearly, he made a mistake by not reporting her missing for three days. But he also has to live with that every day. Relationships are complicated, sometimes messy, and always filled with nuance. We should always keep that in mind before judging others. Additionally, Alaska State Troopers surely interviewed him thoroughly, and he seemed to be forthcoming with the reporters at the Anchorage Daily News. I believe if Valerie Sifsoff met with foul play, it was by someone else. For example, the Anchorage Daily News story published on July 21st described, that night there was a party atmosphere at the campground. I've camped at the Granite Creek campground dozens of times, and although it's peaceful, it's equally raucous at times, with people drinking and partying late into the night. This means that an already inebriated Sifsoff could have stumbled into another campsite, maybe coming into contact with unsavory characters. It's something to consider. But Sifsoff's family is convinced that Valerie ended up in that river, and this seems plausible, especially since two articles of her clothing were located downstream. Normally, I'd have a hard time believing that Sifsoff could have accidentally drowned in Granite Creek. It's a swift river, but not a raging torrent. But. In the summer of 2012, the rains were torrential, with the river flooding its banks well into the fall. In conditions like that, it's possible that if Valerie got too close, she could have been pulled into the water and drowned. Hopefully, Valerie Sifsoff will be found one day, her family finally able to have closure. But until then, her disappearance remains another Alaskan mystery. Alaska currently has over 300 people on the active missing persons lists, and probably hundreds more who've been given up for lost or forgotten with the passage of time. In the future, I'll most certainly be covering more missing persons cases in Alaska, as there are countless stories to be told and many families who live without answers or closure. 